world has experienced an enormous growth in production, unequaled in the entire history of mankind. A production quota that's increased more than 13-fold. And this enormous step is directly linked to our capacity to exploit the fossil fuels, coal and oil. During early industrialization, smoking chimneys, swinging cranes and melting furnaces were potent symbols of power, optimism and money. But progress had its price. During the 20th century, millions of people died of lung cancer and heart and respiratory diseases, due in main to the level of air pollution in major cities all over the world. Genes, inventions, power, black out the past. Forget the quiet cities, bring in the steam and steel, the iron men, the giants. Open the throttle, all aboard, the promised land. Pillars of smoke by day, pillars of fire by night, pillars of progress. Machines to make machines, production to expand production. Enough for tens, thousands, millions, millions, faster and faster, better and better. At the beginning of the 20th century, factories and chimneys sprang up as never before. The burning of coal and oil increased wealth in an inferno of smoke, steam and soot. And for people living in the constantly expanding industrial cities, smoke from chimneys became a natural part of daily life. People sometimes would come to the town if they weren't familiar with it and they'd say, what's that smell? Well, if you live there, you'd say, well, it smells just fine to me. Sometimes um, my grandfather would say, well, that's the smell of money. Because we just took it for granted that if you wanted to have a job, if you wanted the town to be working, that this was the price that you paid. Most people living in the rural district had moved there because they found a job, because they could earn money, and for them it was fantastic. It was uh, the alternative to going to America. And at that time many people called it the German Wild West because it offered all the opportunities America offered. So for them, every factory they saw was a sign of progress, a sign of making money, making a living. Many companies had on the letterhead of their note paper pictures of their own factories, and those factories always had huge clouds of smoke coming out of the chimneys as a symbol of the productivity of that company. You know, smoke equaled progress. There's a saying in the Midlands, where there's muck, there's money. The Ruhr district in Germany is the biggest industrial area in Europe. The presence of coal in the area was very attractive for the industry and hundreds of huge factories shut up. Though not everybody was enthusiastic about the smoking chimneys. Some regions were more or less like a preserve for industry. That is, nature wasn't protected. As the court ruling said, you can't expect nature to survive. And there was a case of someone who owned fruit trees, and he, uh, the fruit trees were very close to a factory. And he said, all the trees were damaged, so I want compensation. And the ruling said, OK, we accept that the fruit trees don't grow any fruits no more, so there was a damage. But you can't expect to get compensation because you live in an industrial area. You have to accept that there was this pollution and damage going on. At the beginning of the 20th century, smoke was so thick in London, then the largest city in the world, that the authorities tried to pass laws against its emission from the many chimneys dotted around the city, but without success. In, at the end of, of the 1800s, people were, were very aware that the smoke was a problem, so they wanted to eliminate smoke. But they still needed to allow some smoke, of course, for people to heat their houses. So they tried to eliminate smoke which was black, but of course, you know, industry would argue, well, my smoke is not black, my smoke is brown, so it's not covered by the legislation. So there's this loophole just, you know, so weakened the law that ultimately it was quite inapplicable. Production in the industrial centers ran day and night, year in, year out, almost without interruption. 
One of the few times where smoke actually ever did disappear from the sky was in the Ruhr district back in 1923. French troops had invaded the industrial area because the German government had refused to pay compensation to France after World War I, and in protest, German workers went on strike. Since it was a general strike, all industrial production was stopped almost overnight. And for all of spring and all of summer, there was no industrial production. So all of a sudden, the air was clean. And funnily enough, the trees and everything started to grow again. And there are reports from people living there say, OK, Look at this, it's fantastic. Trees grow much bigger. Uh, fruits, we now, fruits, we have more fruit and at the same time we can eat it. But the lesson in the end was if the only way to get clean air is to shut down industry, then that's not a way to do it because then people don't have work. And uh, as a consequence, uh, people were quite relieved when the general strike stopped and they could start producing again and get some income. In the 1930s, people realized that smoke from chimneys is not just a sign of wealth and prosperity. For the thousands of tons of soot spreading out over all major cities was a huge economical burden to society. In England alone, 200,000 people were employed in laundries and considerable amounts of money were spent on polishing windows of offices and public buildings. At the same time, people were growing more and more concerned about the health of their children, living literally in the shadow of the urban smoke. Few children get all the vitamin D that they need in their food, but they can make all that is necessary if enough sunlight falls on their skins. If they don't get enough sunlight or enough vitamin, they will develop rickets and bad teeth. Now these children here are getting artificial ultraviolet radiation in order to protect them from rickets. It may be as good as real sunlight, but it's a great deal more expensive. There were fogs, there were, were acidic, hard to breathe, illnesses that were you know, bronchitic in nature, and doctors just recognized this. I suppose you could ask the question then, well, why did they let it continue? If the doctors recognized this, why did they allow this to go on? Well, I suppose you, you could think of two possible reasons. One was simply political, the political will to change that, to change industry, to shift to some other fuel would be very, very difficult. But also the, the mechanisms, you know, coal was the fuel which drove cities. How were they going to change it? Critical voices began attacking the consequences of industrial progress. Here's a sequence from an American documentary of 1939, which describes, among other things, life in the small industrial town of Donora in the state of Pennsylvania. Smoke makes prosperity, they tell you here. Smoke makes prosperity, no matter if you choke on it. We got to face life in these shacks and alleys. We got to let our children take their chances here with rickets, typhoid, TB, or worse. They draw a blank, the kids. They have no business here, this no man's land, this slag heap wasn't meant for them. There's poison in the air we breathe, there's poison in the river. The fog and smoke blow right up and choke us. It was a normal thing for us. We accepted it as being something to live in and around and have it around us all the time. The environment was really something that was normal for us because we grew up in it. 
we didn't see much sunshine here in Denora because of the way you know there was so much smoke from the steel mill and from the zinc work. So this was going on all the time. I don't think we understood that there was sun and vegetation and beautiful surroundings that there were in many other parts of the. Of course, you know, a big back in those days, a big day for us would be a trip to Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh was highly polluted at that time also. It was not until serious accidents began to occur that people started realizing that smoke was more than just a hazard to their health. Smoke can also kill, as in the case of Denora in 1948. For a period of about five days in October in 1948, the fumes from the mills continued to come up and they couldn't go away. They couldn't dissipate. And after five days, people began to get sick in their homes, in the mill, on the streets, and uh, they knew something was wrong, but they didn't know how wrong it was. On Friday morning, uh, we were walking to school. We could barely see the street lights, and they were on, and we could hardly see the traffic signals along McCain Avenue, and we really didn't understand that there was a, a tragedy unfolding within our community. You couldn't hardly see your hand in front of your face if you put it up like that. And it was like night at 12 o'clock noon on Main Street in Denora. Yes. It was like midnight. I went to bed one night and everything was fine. I woke up the next morning and every one of my plants were as dead as they could be. African violets, um, cactus. I forget what the other ones were, but they were all dead and they never came back to life. People start calling the fire station. They couldn't breathe. That's they, right. So uh, we had to carry oxygen to them to get, get, them, get them some oxygen so they could breathe. What happened in the town was that people started to die. So many of them died in such a short period of time that the local funeral homes ran out of caskets. The place I went to go to the Girl Scouts became a temporary morgue. In the five days Denora was covered in smoke from local chimneys, 20 out of 12,000 inhabitants died, and a greater number grew sick. We know that almost half the town was affected, a little more than 40% during the smog had some kind of symptom. But what was more apparent afterwards was that a steady amount of pollution over a long period of time would also worsen and sicken the lives of many. My own grandmother had a heart attack during this smog, but she didn't die. So she's not one of those statistics celebrated in Denora. My grandmother didn't die until her 25th heart attack, seven years later. <laughs> 